there. You can call me Miranda. I hope you do, and I hope we'll get to be real good friends, because I have lots of stories to tell you, lots of little songs to sing, and wonderful poems you'll learn to love. I hope you learn to love me too. But remember, when you want to play my records, just tell Mother you want to listen to Miranda. I want to know your name, too. If you want me to know your name, please have Mother write to me. Don't forget. Now that we know each other, would you like to hear a story? I'll tell you about Aesop. Aesop is the name of a man who lived in far-off Greece before Jesus was born, many, many years ago. He was a slave who became famous because he could tell such wonderful stories about animals. In Aesop's stories, the little animals could do everything people do. They talked and laughed and cried and sang just like the animals you see in the television cartoons. Aesop never wrote down any of his stories. He told them to grown-ups. Then the mothers and daddies went home and told the stories to their children. The children loved Aesop's stories. They were called fables, Aesop's fables. He was such a great storyteller that even today, 2,500 years after he lived, children still love his stories. Perhaps you will too. I hope you do. I'll tell one of Aesop's stories about talking animals now. This is the fable of the lion and the mouse. There was a great big lion who lived in far away Africa. His nearest neighbor was not an elephant, not a giraffe, not a zebra. In a hole in the ground near the lion's den, there lived a little gray field mouse. The mouse was very shy. He never played near the den of the lion because he was afraid of the lion. But one day, when the mouse was out walking, he heard someone snoring. He searched and searched and soon discovered the snores were coming from the lion's den. He went in. There was the lion, fast asleep. The lion stretched in his sleep. He reached out a great paw and put it down right on top of the little mouse. Under the lion's heavy paw, the mouse could not move. He cried out in fear. His cries woke up the lion. When the mouse saw the lion was awake, he begged him, please, Mr. Lion, please don't eat me. I'm too little to be a good breakfast for you. If you don't eat me, I'll be your friend forever. Well, the lion laughed and laughed. He said, What would a great big lion like me need with a friend as small as you? Don't worry, little mouse. I won't eat you because you have made me laugh. How can you ever be my friend? You can't even play with me because I'll have to be so careful not to step on you and hurt you. But I'll be your friend anyway. Go along home, my friend. You'll see, said the little mouse. Someday I'll prove my friendship. A few weeks later, the lion was caught in a trap. A net covered him all over. He couldn't move. He couldn't even wiggle his little toe. He roared and roared, help, help. 
Well, all the animals were afraid when the lion roared. They ran as fast as their legs would carry them, back to their dens and nests and holes and hiding places. Everyone except the little mouse. The mouse found the lion in the net. He knew just what to do for his friend. He put his sharp little teeth to work. He gnawed and gnawed and bit and bit. And bit by bit, he bit the net all the way through. The net fell apart and the lion was free. The mouse had proved that every friend in need is a friend indeed, even if he is a little teeny weeny mouse. Did you like that fable? If you did, I'll tell you another one of Aesop's fables soon. But right now, Miranda would like to tell you a poem of the gingerbread boy. It goes like this. A little old man and his little old wife lived in a house all of their life. Every room was filled with toys, but they had no little girls or boys. Children in the neighborhood came to visit when they could and always found fresh candy bars hiding in the cookie jars. One day, the little old lady said, I think I'll bake some gingerbread. So she did, and she baked a brand new toy for herself, a little gingerbread boy. I'll sing a song while the cookies bake and the song I sing will surely make the minutes fly till the gingerbread's done. Soon I will have a gingerbread son. She sang, and the oven door popped out. Then, with a laughing, happy shout, a gingerbread boy, so cute and cunning, out of the oven came a-running. Come back, he heard his mother say. Oh, no, I'm going to run away. The little old lady and man ran after. They couldn't see him, but heard his laughter. He shouted, I ran and ran and ran from a little old lady and a little old man. As he ran by farmers and cowboys too, he sang, I'll run away from you. He passed a horse, he passed a dog, he passed a cow, he passed a frog. He passed a girl in bobby socks, but he couldn't pass the smart red fox. Said the fox, just jump upon my back. We'll hide and throw them off the track. The boy jumped north instead of south and straight into the fox's mouth. The fox's tummy grew big as his head, for foxes all love gingerbread. And that's the story of the gingerbread boy. At least that's the way Miranda tells it. Other people tell it other ways, but I like my way best. Don't you? When you listen to this record next time, I'll tell it to you again, word for word, the same way. Now, maybe we have time for a few Mother Goose rhymes. They are told in many languages in many lands. Boys and girls all over the world listen to little rhymes, just like our own Mother Goose rhymes. Perhaps you'd like to ask, who is Mother Goose? Well, as far as I can find out, nobody really knows. But she was a good storyteller. And here is one of Mother Goose's nursery rhymes. Little Tommy Tucker sang for his supper. What shall he have? White bread and butter. How shall he cut it without any knife? How shall he marry without any wife? Isn't that a silly rhyme? Because if little Tommy Tucker is really little, why should he want a wife anyway? He should be thinking of going to school instead of getting married. But that's the way Mother Goose told it. Here's another Mother Goose rhyme. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. 
after. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. I'd like to find out, what was Jack's crown? Was he Prince Jack? Did he really wear a crown? Or, or was Mother Goose talking about the crown of his head? Which is really the top of his head. And why on earth did Jill come tumbling after? When she should have been running to get their mother to call the doctor to come and fix Jack's broken crown. If he really did break his head. I don't know the answer. Ask your daddy what he thinks. Daddies usually have the right answer to that kind of question anyway. Now we'll hear about Old Mother Hubbard. Here is what happened to Old Mother Hubbard. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. When she got there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog had none. You know, I think Mother Hubbard was not a very good housekeeper. At least she didn't know what was in the icebox, which Mother Hubbard called a cupboard. If she had known there was no bone in the icebox, she would not have gone to look for a bone. She might even have gone to the market for a can of dog food. I think most dogs like dog food better than plain old bones anyway, don't you? Do you know what a goose looks like? Have you ever seen a goose? Of course you have seen a picture of a goose. Well, I'll tell you the story of a strange and wonderful goose. This is another one of Aesop's fables. And for many years, children have learned the story of this goose. Your mother and father heard this story when they were children. It goes like this. A farmer who raised geese went out to the nests one day to gather eggs. He went to the nest of the first goose, and guess what he found? A big goose egg. He took the egg out and looked at it. This egg was not like other eggs. It was shiny and bright in the sunlight. This goose egg was solid gold. He ran quickly into the house to show the golden egg to his wife. He said, look dear, we're rich. We have a goose that lays golden eggs. Only one egg, she asked. Only one now, the farmer replied. But wait and see. Perhaps the goose will lay another golden egg tomorrow. The next day, there was another golden egg in the nest. And the next day, another. And the next, and the next, and the next. Then his wife said, This is taking too long. I don't want to wait so long to get rich. I want to get all the golden eggs right now. Wait, dear, the farmer told her. We'll be rich quickly enough. No, 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 his wife screamed like a spoiled child. Let's kill the goose and take out all the golden eggs now. Well, the farmer did as his wife asked. He killed the goose, and lo and behold, what do you think? There was not one single gold egg. Instead of getting rich quick, they could get no more golden eggs because he had killed the goose. Aesop's fables always teach a lesson. Can you guess the lesson of the golden eggs? Next time you hear somebody say, never kill the goose that lays the golden eggs, remember the story that Miranda told you. Other writers have written stories like the Aesop fables. Children in many lands have heard them. One of these writers was Jean de La Fontaine. 
He was a Frenchman. And his stories have been translated into many languages. Here is one of his famous fables. Once upon a time, there was a grasshopper who sang all day long. He loved to hear himself sing, and so did all the other animals. He went hopping about the woods all summer, singing away. He watched the other animals working, gathering food. They were getting ready for winter when there would be no food because nothing grows in the winter time. All the earth is cold and icy and covered with snow. And so when winter came, the singing grasshopper had nothing to eat. He went to the home of his friend, the ant. He knocked on the door. Mr. Ant, said the grasshopper, I'm hungry. May I have something to eat? Well, the ant told the grasshopper, Last summer, when I was working, you were playing. If you want to eat in the winter, you have to work in the summer. I worked last summer, said the grasshopper. What did you do? the ant asked. Well, I sang all day long, the grasshopper replied. Well, said the ant, you can just sing some more right now because I have no extra food. I hope this teaches you a lesson. Now then, what was the lesson the grasshopper learned? Talk to your mommy and daddy and ask them what lesson they learned from this story. Do you still like Miranda's stories? Well, I know lots more. I don't think I'll ever run out of stories to tell you. One I like especially is about a fox who went for a stroll through the countryside. Birds sang in the trees as he passed. The mockingbird went. And the other birds were so jealous, they stopped singing because the only one who could sing beautiful songs, like the Mockingbird, was the Nightingale. And this was in the daytime. And the Nightingale was in his nest, fast asleep. The fox stopped under the Mockingbird's tree. That's a beautiful song, the fox said. Why do you sing? Because I'm happy, the mockingbird said right back to the fox. I've been eating grapes all day, and they are delicious. Where are the grapes? The fox wanted to know. Growing just below me, right in this tree. I can see the grapevine from where I'm sitting, replied the mockingbird. Then the fox saw the grapes. He jumped and tried to reach them, but couldn't jump high enough. He jumped and jumped higher and higher, but not quite high enough to reach the grapes. Finally, when he realized he could not jump as high as the grapes, the fox said to the mockingbird, I don't want any of the sour old grapes anyway. They're probably so sour I couldn't even eat them. And away went the fox. That's how the expression started. Sour grapes. Did you ever hear anyone say, don't count your chickens before they are hatched? I'm sure you have. Well then, would you like to know how that saying began? Well, I'll tell you about it. A farmer who lived far out in the country had a beautiful daughter. Her mother made all of her clothes. She had never been to a store to buy a dress. So she dreamed all day of a beautiful new dress. At last, she made a plan 
to get her own dress. She went to the barn and milked the cow. She took the milk and put it in a pail. She put the pail on top of her head and started to tom. As she walked, she daydreamed. She thought to herself, I will take the milk to town and sell it. With the money I get for the milk, I shall buy some eggs. I shall take the eggs and hatch little chickens. When the chickens grow up, they will lay eggs. Then I will sell lots and lots of eggs and go to the store with the money I earn from the eggs and buy my new dress. I'll wear my new dress to the dance. When the boys look at me and admire me in my new dress, I'll toss my head at them. And she tossed her head to show how she would act in her new dress. But she forgot one thing. She still had the pail of milk on top of her head. And when she tossed her head, the pail of milk went sailing into the bushes and spilled all over the ground. Now she had no milk to sell. And with no milk to sell, she would have no money to buy eggs. And with no eggs to hatch, she would have no chickens. And that's how the saying started. Don't count your chickens before they are hatched. Miranda has lots of little friends in every state in the Union. One of them is named Caroline. Every morning, Caroline's daddy drives her to school in the family car. And every morning, Caroline and her daddy drive by a corner where a policeman stands directing traffic. He holds up his hand and the cars all stop. He moves his arm one way and the cars go in that direction. He moves his arm again, and the cars go in the other direction. He works and works and works, and hundreds of automobiles go whizzing by him. But there is a very strange thing about Caroline's policeman. He never smiles. His face is very unhappy. And nobody likes a policeman with an unhappy face. Caroline said to her daddy one morning, Why doesn't the policeman smile? Perhaps, her daddy replied, He doesn't smile at people because people don't smile at him. Would you like to try to make him smile? Oh, yes, daddy. Do you think we can? Well, we can try, her father said. So every morning when Caroline and her daddy drove by the policeman, here's what they would do. First, daddy would roll the window down. Then, as they neared the policeman, Caroline would put her face in the window, being very careful not to stick her head out of the car. As she passed by the policeman, Caroline would say to him as loud as she could, Good morning! The first morning, the policeman looked straight ahead. He did not reply. The second morning, Caroline said, Good morning! The policeman said very shyly, Hi! The third morning, Caroline shouted, Good morning! The policeman said, Good morning! and started to smile. The next morning, Daddy said, Caroline, I think the policeman will smile at you today. And as the car drove past the policeman, Caroline said, Good morning! The policeman broke out in a great big smile and shouted to Caroline, Good morning! 
Now, every day when Caroline passes the policeman, she shouts, Good morning! And he smiles right into Caroline's face and says, Good morning, sweetheart! So that's the story of the policeman who wouldn't smile. Now you know that if you want someone to smile at you, even if they look very unhappy, just keep on smiling at them long enough and sooner or later they will be your friend and smile back. Now let's all be very quiet and settle down for a brand new story never told before. This is Miranda's very own story. It's the tale of the Gobbywalk. And I'll bet you thought the Gobbywalk had no tail. Well, every Gobbywalk has his very own special private waggy tail. Some are long and some are short. Some are smooth and some are bushy. They are almost all colors, but never green. If you want to hear this story, stay very quiet, because here comes Miranda's lovely gobbywogs. Here's the tale. I love the purple gobbywog. I do not love the green one. I'm not so sure there is a green one, for I have never seen one. The baby purple gobbywog pretends that he's a travel clock. He cannot tick, he cannot talk. He cannot run, he cannot walk. And when he rides, he gets a pain, so he never takes a train. In gobbywog land, there's always rain, so he can't fly in any plane. He hates to hear his mother fuss, and so he never takes a bus. All day he sits upon a rock, watching hands go round the clock. Little hands and big hands too, and some hands you can see clear through. Green gobby walks are hard to see, unless you're little, just like me. When you see purple gobby walks, they are usually wearing bobby socks. Some are brown, some are red. One has a polka dotted head. Some gobby walks have 15 feet, and licorice sticks are all they eat. There's one whose hair comes to his knees. He can't say thank you, ma'am, or please. You can buy them by the score at any Gobby Walkland store. The Gobby Walks that I have met are fun to hold and fun to pet. They'll bring a circus to your chair. They'll brush your teeth and comb your hair. If you want one, cross your toes, hold your ears and rub your nose. Cross your arms and cross your knees, count to 10 and then say, please. If you can do this in your sleep, a gobbywock is yours to keep. Hi, Miranda. Why, hello. Who in the world are you? I'm a gobbywock. A real gobbywock? In person. Well, little gobbywock, now that you're here, what would you like to do? I would like to sing a song for all the boys and girls who play this record. How nice! Well, boys and girls, let's listen while this little gobbywock sings the gobbywock song. Most children know just one prayer, and that's the one they say at night before they go to bed. 
You know, the one that starts, Now I lay me down to sleep. Well, there are lots and lots of other prayers. Would you like to hear a prayer or two that boys and girls used to say many years ago? Many of them still say these prayers. Here's one for the morning when you first get up. Now, before I run and play, let me not forget to pray to God who kept me through the night and woke me with the morning light. Help me, Lord, to love you more than I have ever loved before. In my work and in my play, be with me always through the day. <laughs>